Hello and welcome back to another full step-by-step -step PC build guide and today I'm going to be showing you how to build a PC in Fractal's brand new Pop Air. So the Pop is a whole new series from Fractal with a whole variety of different options. For starters you've got three different sizes. There's the Pop Mini which is for motherboards up to micro ATX in size. We've got the standard Pop case which I have which fits motherboards up to ATX and there's also the Pop XL which will fit up to ATX motherboards. Now each of those three sizes comes in two different options. There is the Air version which I've got here which has a mesh panel on both the front and the top and there's also a silent version where you get a solid panel on both the front and the top. Now the other option that you have is RGB or non-RGB and in particular the Pop Air which I have comes a whole variety of different colours. I've got the cyan version which I think looks pretty cool but it's also available in magenta orange and green as well if you prefer. Okay let's take a look at the other parts I'm going to be building with today. For the motherboard I'm going to be using the MSI Z690 Edge Wi-Fi. For the CPU I'm going to be using Intel's 12th Gen i7 the 12700K. Keeping our CPU cool I'm going to be using a 240mm AIO from Fractal. It's their Celsius Plus S24 Prisma. Because I've got an older version of the cooler and we want to use it with a 12700K, we're going to also have to pick up Fractal's LGA1700 mounting bracket. For thermal paste, I'm going to be using the GC Extreme from Gelid. For RAM, I've got 32GB of XPG's Lancer RGB DDR5 RAM at 6000MHz. For storage, I'm going with a single Gen 4 NVMe M.2 SSD from Savrant. It's their Rocket 4 Plus in 2TB capacity. Powering the whole build, I'm going to be using Fractal's Ion Plus 2 860W Platinum Fully Modular Power Supply. For the graphics card, I'm going to be using one of the biggest graphics cards I've ever used. It's the Zotac Gaming RTX 3080 Ti AMP Extreme Holo. So out of the box, the Pop series of cases don't have a front panel type C by default, but Fractal do offer an optional kit which allows you to add one of these in. So I'll be showing you how to install this today as well. And the final part for today's build are some blue and black cable extensions from CableMod. Okay, that's all the parts. Let's get on with the build. So I'm going to make a start by preparing our case. As we go, I'm going to point out the main case features. So our tempered glass side panel is held on with two captive thumb screws at the back. Once these have been loosened, we can simply slide the panel backwards, tilt it away and lift out. Our other side panel is removed in exactly the same way. We just need to loosen the captive thumb screws at the back. Once that's been done, pull the panel backwards, tilt away and lift out. Taking a look at our case's front I.O., it's nice to see that the colour accent continues up here. We've got a power button, we've got a button to control the RGB. It's a single press to cycle through the colours and you hold the button in for two seconds to change the mode. We've got a separate headphone and microphone jack. We've got two USB 3.0 Type-A ports and we've also got a cutout for a USB Type-C port which is an optional add-in. We've got a mesh dust filter on the top of the case which is magnetically attached so it can simply be pulled away. Take a look at our front panel, you can see the upper part of it is mesh while we've got a solid component at the bottom. We've got a little tab here with the Fractal logo on it and if we pull on this the bottom bit is magnetically attached and can simply be lifted away. So the reason the bottom of the case is solid is because you're going to be able to fit two five and a quarter inch drives here. We can remove the storage tray by pulling it forward and away. And then to remove our front panel, all we need to do is simply pull it forward. With the front panel removed, you can see our two 120mm Aspect 12 RGB fans. And we've got the bracket for our five and a quarter inch drive. It's held on with four screws at the bottom. So with the screws removed, we can simply remove the bracket. You would then fit your up to two five and a quarter inch drives to the bracket before installing it back in at the front. If we take a look at the panel we've just removed, you can see that Fractal have gone with just mesh at the front. There's no additional dust filters behind the panel. At the bottom of the case, we've got a dust filter over our power supply's intake fan. It's a tray style filter and it can simply be pulled away at the back. Moving into the case's main compartment, it is compatible with up to full-sized ATX motherboards, but you can also fit a micro-ATX or mini-ATX motherboard as well. As well as the two pre-installed 120mm ARGB fans at the front, we've also got a 120mm ARGB fan at the rear. 
There's also a further two fan mounting locations at the top where you can fit either a 120 or 140 millimeter fan. And again, if you prefer, you can fit up to two 140 millimeter fans at the front as well. In terms of radiator support, it's up to a 280 millimeter radiator at the front, up to a 240 millimeter radiator at the top, and up to a 120 millimeter radiator at the rear. At the rear of the case, we've got seven horizontal PCI expansion slot covers. And because the front fans are installed on the outside of the case, you can fit really large graphics cards up to 405 millimeters in length with the front fans installed. Taking a look at the rear of the case, you can see we don't have a separate bracket for installing our power supply. So we're gonna to have to put it in from the side and then screw it in directly from the back. Um, the popper is compatible with full size ATX power supplies up to an officially supported length of 170 millimeters. Although if you remove the drive trays, you are gonna be able to fit longer power supplies. Moving into the rear compartment, it's really nice to see the Fractal have continued the cyan color theme to here, particularly because once you put the side panel on, you're not actually gonna see any of this, but it's a really nice touch, I think, to include it. In terms of cutouts, we've got really large cutouts here and here, um, although it is important to point out there isn't actually any rubber grommets on them. Um, in terms of cable tie-down points, we've got seemingly a plenty of cable tie-down points here and here, and we've got some Velcro cable straps already pre-installed to help manage the cables. In terms of drive mounting locations, we've got a dedicated 2.5 inch drive bracket here, which can accommodate up to two 2.5 inch drives. To remove it, you simply need to loosen the thumb screw, and the drive can then simply be lifted away. Alternatively, you can mount this drive bracket in the main body of the case. Alternatively, if you want to increase the drive storage in the case, you can purchase an additional one of these brackets from Fractal. So you can have one in the front and one at the rear. At the bottom of the case, we've got two more drive trays, one fixed to the bottom, one fixed to the top. They're both held on with a thumb screw. So if we loosen the thumb screw, we can simply pull the drive tray forward and lift it away. Same thing with the one on the top. We've got a thumb screw here. We loosen it. Again, we just need to pull the drive tray forward and we're able to remove it. If you prefer, you can internally mount the drive tray here. It just simply slots down into place and then you can tighten up the thumb screw. Now, if you wanna have two drive trays at the bottom and one up here, you can do this, but you're gonna to have to purchase an additional drive tray from Fractal. So what do you wanna go with five and a quarter inch drives at the bottom? If you just install the bottom five and a quarter inch drive, you can fit one of these drive trays mounted at the top and move the additional one to here. If you want two five and a quarter inch drives, your only hard drive mounting location is gonna be here. So taking a closer look at the drive trays, in each of these drive trays, you're gonna be able to fit both a two and a half inch and three and a half inch drive. You can see we've got mounting holes here. So if we set our two and a half inch drive on, all you're gonna do is simply screw that into place at the back. Then on top of this, we can set a three and a half inch drive and you'll see here, we've got holes at the side to screw it into place. Now, when you've got a drive below it, you're gonna install it in this upper location. And what you'll notice is the three and a half inch drive sits quite high above the drive tray. So if you're gonna use it in the two locations down at the bottom of the case, there's no problem, you can double mount your drives. However, at that additional upper location at the back of the case, you're only gonna be able to fit a three and a half inch drive and you're gonna to need to mount it down in this bottom location. With the drive sitting up, there's just not enough space to get the side panel back on again. Down at the bottom, attached to our case cables, we've got our case accessory bag. So I'll show you what this contains now. So this is what comes in our accessory bag. We've got four groups of screws, each comes individually packaged. I've just opened them up. So we've got these four larger screws for securing our power supply. We've got these screws for securing three and a half inch drives. We've got the smaller screws with a flat head for securing our motherboard. And we've also got these smaller screws with a little lip around the outside for securing five and a quarter inch and two and a half inch drives. We've got eight hard drive dampeners for mounting three and a half inch drives. And we've got some cable ties. Remember there is also Velcro straps pre-installed at the back of the case. Also in the case's box, we've got these radiator offset brackets and mounting screws. So you may need to use these if you're going with the radiator at the top of the case, and it's designed to just move the radiator further forward, particularly if you had large RAM or large heat sinks on your motherboard that were gonna get in the way with a top mounted radiator. So we may or may not need to use this later on, 
but we'll see when we come to fit our radiator. Last thing for us to do is fit our optional USB Type-C cable. But before I do, I just wanted to show you how the RGB works. If we remove this protective cover, we've got a standard 3-pin 5-volt ARGB connector. The controller is directly above this, so all you would need to do is plug your ARGB accessories into here, and then you're going to be able to use the case button to control the RGB. To install our Type-C connector, first thing to do is remove the placeholder cover. It's held on with two screws. With the screws removed, we should simply be able to pull the cover away. And then all we need to do is line our cable into place. And then we're going to secure it into place using the two screws we have just removed. We're now ready to start work on the motherboard and we're going to install our CPU, the bracket for our CPU killer, our M.2 SSD and our RAM before we put the motherboard into the case. To install our CPU, we need to push this lever down and out and lift it all the way to the top, and then we can open the cover. We can then insert the CPU into the socket. We've got little notches at the top and the bottom, which are going to line up with the CPU, and importantly, the text is the correct way up. Once we're happy everything's lined up, we can close the cover down. If we apply a little bit of pressure here, quite often the black bit of plastic will pop off, and we'll put that into the motherboard box. Then all we need to do is close the lever down, we're now ready to install our M.2 SSD. This motherboard has four sockets, one behind this heatsink, one behind this heatsink, and two behind the bottom heatsink. But in general, it's the top socket you're going to want to use for the fastest speeds. So we need to remove the heatsink. It's held on with two screws. Then we can insert our M.2 SSD into the socket at a slight angle. If we go ahead and flatten it down, we've got a little cover here which all we need to do is pull down and that's going to hold the drive into place. If you're using the motherboard for the first time, you will have some plastic protection on the back of the heatsink you're going to need to remove. I've used this before, which is why there's none there. We are now ready to install our RAM and because we have only got two sticks of RAM, we're going to want to install it in the second and fourth slot along from the CPU. So there's clips on both sides that we just need to open. Then we can line the RAM up with the slot. Once we're happy everything's lined up, it's just some firm pressure to the top and it's going to clip into place. And then the same thing with our second stick. Next, we need to insert the back plate for our CPU cutter. Now these bits are adjustable, so you can get them lined up with the holes at the back of the motherboard. And then once we've got things in the right place, it's just a simple matter of pushing it into place. Then we're going to want to get these standoffs labelled Intel 1700. I have an older version of the cutter, so they didn't come with the cutter itself. Um, so I had to get this separately from Fractal as part of their Intel LGI 1700 mounting bracket. So we just need to screw one of these onto each corner. We are now ready to get our motherboard installed in the case. Importantly, we've got nine standoffs here and they're all in the right position for an ATX motherboard like we have. The middle standoff is slightly different. You'll notice it doesn't have a screw hole in it and it's designed to go through the middle hole in the motherboard, hold the motherboard in place while you're able to get the other standoffs in. So we can insert our motherboard into place, aligning that middle standoff up with the middle hole on the motherboard. And that's it, the motherboard has gone through that middle standoff and you'll notice if I let go, it's actually going to hold it in place. Then we need to use the eight screws that I pointed out to you earlier on to secure the motherboard into place. The next thing to do is get our case cables plugged in. Our HD audio cable is going to go into this header down the bottom left hand side of the motherboard. So I'm going to go ahead and bring it through the cutout. Importantly, there is a pin missing on the top row on the motherboard and we've also got a hole missing on the cable, so it's important we line things up the right way and then push it into place. Moving over to the bottom right hand side of the motherboard, we've got our front panel header here. And normally you have a whole range of different cables to plug into the individual pins. Each of these pins needs a different cable. Fortunately, we've only got our power switch to plug in, so it goes into pins three and four on the top row from the left hand side. So we bring it through the cutout. It doesn't matter which way this goes in, I'm just going to plug it in with the text facing down. Moving up the right hand side of the motherboard, our USB 3.0 cable is going to go into this header here. So we'll bring it through the cutout, line it up, and push into place. Just below this, we've got our USB Type-C header, so we'll bring our cable through the cutout, line it up, and push into place. The next thing for us to connect up is our fans. 
So coming from each of our fans, we've got two cables. The first is a three pin connector, which is going to power the fan. Unfortunately, coming from each of the cables, we've got a three pin splitter cable. So we're actually gonna be able to daisy chain all our fans together and just plug one of the three pin cables into a system fan header on our motherboard. The other cable coming from our fans is a standard three pin five volt ARGB connector. And again, nice to see we've got a splitter cable on the end. So again, we're gonna be able to daisy chain all the fans together and plug them into one of the ARGB headers. So I'm gonna make a start with the three pin power connectors coming from the fans. So I'm gonna join our two front fans together. And then we've also got another connector coming from our rear fan. So we'll bring it through and plug it into here. So that leaves us a single three pin connector, which I'm gonna pass through this cutout and get plugged into the motherboard. I think it's probably gonna look tidier coming through the top here. So even though there's four pins on the header and three pins on the cable, there's a little notch on the side, so it will only go into the right three pins. And then we can pull the excess cable through to the back. Okay, next thing to do is get the ARGB connected up. So we've got the cable coming from our rear fan. I'm gonna take off this rubber protector coming from our front fan. Make sure we've got things lined up the correct way and then push the two connectors into place. Then we can plug the other end into the cable coming from our other front fan. So again, just make sure they line up. There's little arrows on the cables if you're not sure which way they go. And then we've got a single three pin five volt RGB header on this front set of connectors. We've got two places we can plug this. We can plug it into our motherboard if we want our motherboard to control the lighting. The alternative thing we could do is plug it into this ARGB header and then use the button on the top of the case to control the ARGB, which is what I think I'm going to do because I'm sure you're probably interested to know what the ARGB effects built into this controller are like. So we just need to remove this protective cover here. Again, make sure we've got our cable plugged in the right way round and then plug it into the header at the top. Now, one of the nice things we have got is we've got another ARGB connector, which is gonna be really handy because we're gonna to need to plug our AIO into here. And then we're actually gonna be able to control all the ARGB effects on the fans and the AIO using the controller at the top of the case. The only additional case cable for us to plug in is this SATA power cable, which is actually gonna power our ARGB controller. So once we've installed our power supply, we'll plug it into here. Next thing to do is get our power supply installed. This is a fully modular power supply, meaning it comes without any of the cables plugged in. I've gone ahead and plugged in the cables that we're gonna need. So we're gonna need a 24 pin cable, two eight pin EPS cables, a SATA cable to power our RGB hub, and also we've got three eight pin EPS cables installed as well. I've also gone ahead and plugged in our blue and black cable mod cable extensions for our 24 pin cable. And I've also plugged in three eight pin PCIe cables, which is what our graphics card is going to need. I have used three separate cables um, for the PCIe because we have them in the box and generally you're better with a power hungry card like we have to spread the power over three cables rather than using the little splitter cables that come. You can see on the cable here, we have, each cable has two eight pin cables which divide into a six and a two. So I've used individual cables so the power is gonna be split evenly over the three cables. Final thing to mention, we've got this little button on the side of the power supply. It says zero RPM and it's turned to on. So that means if our power supply is under low load states, the power supply's fan will stop spinning, reducing noise. So this is turned on, which is just the way I want it. So just before we get the power supply into the case, this is our power supply's intake fan. Um, remember we've got that cutout with the dust filter on at the bottom of the case, so we're gonna to want to install it with this facing down the way so the power supply can get lots of cool air. So all we need to do is slide the power supply in from the side, bring it all the way to the back of the case, and then we can secure it into place with four of the larger screws from the accessory bag. Next, we want to get our power supply cables plugged in. So our two 8-pin EPS cables are gonna go into these headers at the top. So we'll bring them through the cutout, line the cables up with the headers and push into place. And then we can pull the excess cable through to the back. And hopefully now you'll see the reason I've chosen not to use cable extensions at the top here 
because once our radiator is installed, we're not actually going to see the cable extensions and cable management is going to be much easier at the back of the case without them and we're going to get no benefit with them at the front. We can then bring our 24 pin cable through the cutout, line it up with the header and push into place. We've then got these cable combs on the cables which are going to help organise the cables. And as well we're going to want to plug the SATA cable coming from our ARGB controller into the SATA cable from our power supply. So line them up and push into place. We're now ready to start working on the AIO. We're going to want to set our fans onto the radiators the first thing to do. Now importantly we are going to want the cables coming out the back. Um, and I've already lined things up in the case and this is going to be the back. So we'll set the fans into place. And then we're going to use these long radiator screws to secure the fans to the radiator. Next thing for us to do is get the cables on our fans plugged into this hub on our radiator. So we've got three 4-pin PWM connectors and a 3-pin 5-volt ARGB connector. So we can plug the PWM cables coming from our fans into these connectors. There's one and two. We're also going to want to plug one of the ARGB cables from our fans into the ARGB header on the hub. That's it plugged into place. Now it does have a little splitter cable here, so we can then plug the other connector coming from our other fan into it. Then what we need to do is just tidy these cables. This is going to be the back of the radiator where it's not going to be seen, so we can use some cable ties just to manage the cables along here. Next thing to do is put our LGA 1700 bracket onto our water block. It just slots in the back and then if we twist it round, that's going to hold it in place. Now coming from here, we've got two cables. We've got a 4-pin PWM cable, which is going to go into our CPU fan header, and we've got an ARGB cable. Um, normally you plug this into your motherboard, but because we're going to use the controller at the back, we're going to plug it into that extra connector coming from the fan and then all the RGB on the water block and also the fans is going to be synced up with the case. The next thing I want to do is show you how to install the radiator offset bracket. I have sized this radiator up in the case and it will actually fit as long as it's not installed all the way over to the left hand side without using the offset bracket. If you did want it right up against the left hand side you would need to use the offset bracket. An idea of this bracket is it moves the radiator slightly further forward in the case. So importantly you are going to want to size it up the right way round, um, which is this way here. So this is the back. So when we install it it's here in the normal mounting screws, it's going to move the radiator slightly further forward. Now importantly for securing this into place, it's the screws that come with the radiator that you're going to want to use, not the screws that come with the mounting bracket. Next we can add some thermal paste to the centre of the CPU. We can then lower our cooler down into place, line it up with the bracket we have fitted to the motherboard. Now importantly if you are using the cooler from new, there will be some plastic protection on the back of the cold plate that you are going to need to remove. As I have used this cooler before, there wasn't any there. Then we have got a thumb screw to go on each corner. So the reason I've opted to install the water block first, um, normally I would prefer to do the radiator, is once the radiator is in place we're not going to have access to these headers at the top of the motherboard. And this is our CPU fan header here that we're going to want to plug this 4-pin PWM cable coming from the water block into. So I'm just going to route the cable round the bottom and up to the top. And then we can get it plugged into the CPU fan header at the top of the motherboard and then we'll just tuck the excess cable down and out of the way. Same thing with our ARGB cable, I'm just going to tuck it around the bracket and then at the top I'm just going to pass the cable through to the back of the case. We can then bring our radiator round and up to the top of the case and then we can use the screws from the radiator offset bracket kit to secure the radiator at the top. 
and then we can replace the top dust filter. Then at the top we've got the RGB cable coming from our water block, but fortunately we had one spare header left coming from our fans. So it's just a matter of lining those up and pushing into place. There we go. We are now ready to install the GPU, so we're going to need to remove the second and third expansion slot cover from the top. We can then open the clip on the motherboard. Then we need to line the GPU up with the slot on the motherboard. Once we're happy everything's in place, just some firm pressure and the GPU is going to clip into place. We can then secure it into place with the two screws we removed. So you can see because this is such a large GPU there is actually quite a bit of sag on it. But fortunately it does come with an anti-sag bracket which we'll install now. So lining this up, it looks like it's these two screws that we're going to need to remove to install the bracket. So we're going to want to keep these slot covers in place. Slide the bracket into place. And then we'll put the thumb screws back into place. Next we can loosen this little thumb screw here. That's going to allow us to slide this bracket down to where it's in between the two fans and the GPU. You can push it up slightly and then tighten it again. You notice this cable coming from our support bracket, it's an ARGB cable, so there is some ARGB effects on here. So I'm just going to feed this cable through to the back. You'll notice this ARGB cable coming from our support bracket also has a little splitter cable. So all I'm going to do is separate these two fans here. I'm going to plug the GPU support bracket into one of the fans. And then on the other end, I'm going to plug in the splitter cable. There we go. Then we can bring our PCIe cables through the cutout at the bottom and get them plugged into the graphics card. Again, we've got some cable combs on the cables to help organize them. Okay, last thing to do is some cable management so we can get our side panel back on again. We've got plenty of cable tie down points and cable ties included in the accessory bag. We've also got these Velcro straps as well and plenty of space down at the bottom for our power supply cables. So we've now reached the most nerve-wracking part of any PC build. We need to flip the power switch and see does it actually work. Importantly, I have loaded a Windows 11 bootable USB drive into the back of the PC. If you don't know how to make one of those, I've done a video on it and you'll find a link to that in the description. Okay, here it goes. So that's a good sign. We've got fans spinning, lights on the PC. So all we're going to have to do is watch the screen and see what happens. So that's good, we've got the MSI logo appearing. And that's us through to the Windows installer screen. So I'm now gonna show you how to install Windows 11 and get this PC set up. Okay, so over the next lot of screens, there's a whole variety of options. I'm gonna pick the ones that are relevant to me. If you have different ones, pick the options that apply to you. I'm from the United Kingdom, so I'm just gonna click on next. I'm gonna click install now. If you've got a Windows product key, go ahead and enter it here. If you don't, click I don't have a product key. Select the version of Windows you're going to get a product key for in the future. I'm going to select Windows 11 Pro and click Next. We're going to accept the license terms and click Next. I'm going to go for a custom install. We've only got one drive installed, so we're going to have to select it. If you have more than one drive, you're going to pick where you want to install Windows and then click Next. And this step is going to take a little bit of time, so I'll skip through it. 
Okay, so again, because I have United Kingdom, I'm going to click yes and yes again. I'm going to skip a secondary keyboard. So we need to give our device a name, click next. I'm going to set it up for personal use, click next. So if you've got a Microsoft account, you go ahead and put your details in here. Um, if you don't have one, you can create an account. Um, if you prefer to make an offline account, which is what I'm going to show you today, I'm going to click an offline account. Um, it's going to warn us that we're going to have limited features. We're going to go skip for now. And then I need to put my name in. And then I'm going to have to set up a password. And I'm going to have to set up three security questions. I'm going to let apps use my location. Click accept. Yes to find my device. Accept. Um, just the required data. Accept. Uh, no syncing. Accept. Uh, no again. No again. Okay, that's us through to Windows. The first thing I like to do is get Windows fully up to date. So we click on the Windows icon, click on the Settings tab, and click on Windows Update. So what it's going to do is probably find a whole load of updates. Um, once they're ready, we're going to click on Install. The computer is probably going to restart a number of times. We're going to keep coming back here and checking for more updates. And it's only once there's no further updates available that we're going to proceed. Okay, that's Windows fully up to date. Whenever I click on check for updates, there's no further updates available. Next thing to do is get our drivers installed. So we're going to start over on our motherboards page on MSI's website. We're on the driver tab and we're on Windows 64-bit. So we're going to want to install the chipset driver, so we'll download that. Onboard VGA drivers we're not going to need because we've got a dedicated graphics card. LAN drivers we'll go ahead and install. So we'll download the Wi-Fi driver and also the Bluetooth driver. Onboard audio drivers, we're going to install the Realtek HT Universal driver. We don't need any of the SATA drivers uh, and the other drivers will install the Intel Management Engine and the Serial I.O. drivers. So we can close this down and then we're going to head over to our Downloads folder. What I'm going to do, I'm going to right click and go extract all and extract. And then I'm just going to repeat that for each of the files. Then we can go ahead and delete the compressed folders. And we're going to make a start at installing these one by one, starting off with the chipset drivers. Click yes, next, accept, install, and finish. We can then go back to the downloads and we'll install the serial IO. Click yes. Next, accept, next, next, next. And we're going to have to restart our computer, so we'll do that now by clicking finish. The audio drivers. Next. And again, we're going to have to restart our computer, so we'll do that now. We'll install the Bluetooth drivers. Click yes, next, next, accept, next. We'll just go for a typical install and install and finish. And then the Wi-Fi drivers. Click next, we'll agree and install. Yes, and finish. And then finally, the management engine. Click yes, next, accept, next, next, and then finish. Okay, so that's all the drivers installed from MSI's website. We're now going to need to install the drivers for our graphics card. So over on NVIDIA's webpage, again, you'll find links to all this in the description. And I've already pre-populated all these pull-down menus with what we need for our 3080 Ti. So we're going to click on search and download and download. Okay, so we can click on open file, click yes and okay. So we've got an option here, we can install just the driver or we can install the driver with the GeForce Experience. I'm just going to install the driver today and click agree and continue. And um, we're just going to go for an express installation, click next. And it is normal for the screen to flicker during this installation just as the driver is being installed. Okay, so that's the driver installed. We can click on close. 
Um, next thing for us to do is install some of the software we're going to need to control the RGB in the build. So we head back over to MSI's webpage for our motherboard. This time we're in the utility tab. Again, I select Windows 11 64 bit and we're going to download MSI Center. We then head over to our downloads folder, right click and extract all and extract. We can then click on the file, click yes, OK, and install. And click on finish. We then go down to our start menu. We've got the MSI Center here. We're going to right click on it and we're going to click run as an administrator. Click yes. We're going to have to scan down to the bottom. And uh, we're going to click I agree and OK. We can then click on start now. And I'm just going to skip this for now. And what we're going to want to do to install for controlling the lighting is Mystic Light. So we'll click on install. So we can then open Mystic Light. So at the moment we can see the logo on the IO shield is currently set to rainbow. I think I'm going to go with a steady colour for it. And I think this is actually going to look quite nice in magenta. Um, the case controls are really quite nice in a combination of cyan and magenta and it fits in really well with what we've got. So to get that we're going to have to set this middle one to zero and then I'm going to click on apply. And you'll notice then the dragon logo um, has turned to magenta. If we want to control the RAM we can click on it. At the moment it's currently set to default. And again, I think I'm going to go with a steady color for it. And this time I'm going to try and set it to cyan. So it should be zero for red. And then we're going to want 255. And then we can click on apply. And you'll see our RAM then has changed to cyan, which matches really nicely with the back of the case. Okay, so that's the motherboard and RAM set up just the way I wanted. Next thing to do is get the graphics card RGB set up. So we head over to our graphics cards page over in Zotec's website. We're going to click on downloads. We're going to select the files that we want. So we're going to want the software and driver. And view results. So here we've got the Firestorm, which is what we're looking for. We'll click on download. And then we can click open file, extract all, extract, and then we can click on Firestorm. We're going to click on more information and run anyway. Yes. OK. Next. Next. Install. And then we need to click on finish. So we can then open Firestorm. Click yes. And we're going to allow access. Okay, so that's us into the Firestorm software. It's actually the Spectra tab that we're going to want. At the moment, we've got three areas of ARGB on our graphics card. Um, at the moment, it's set to synchronize, which is the way we want it. We're on the animated effects. We've got standard effects here as well. Um, I think I'm going to go for duet. And then we've got a range of colors that we can select here. Um, they're not currently showing up at the moment because I think the graphics card is currently an idle. So we click on idle, select duet, and you see it's actually changed color. Um, looking at the color options we have, so this isn't too bad. This as well. But I think I'm going to go in and try and pick my own colors. Okay, so this is about as close as I can get to cyan and magenta. There doesn't seem to be an option to actually put the text number in. You have to actually drag this, and I really struggled to get this to 255, 255, and 0. Managed to okay on this side. So if you were looking for an update and improvement to the software, actually being able to type the number in that you were looking for would make this much better. So I think that's us set up just the way we want. We can go ahead and close this down. So I also want to show you the ARGB effects from the Cases controller. So if I press the button, it's going to cycle through the various different effects. So we're just pressing the button, we'll go through the different colors.
and then if I hold the button in, it's going to cycle through the various modes. So hold it in for two seconds, and then the mode will change, hold it in again. That turns the lighting off. And then we're back to the actual effect that I like. So I think that's the ARGB setup, just the way I want it. Okay, so I now want to head over to the BIOS, but before I do that, I want to make sure I've got the latest version downloaded to a USB drive. So we're back at our motherboards page. We've got the latest version of the BIOS here from the 26th of the 5th, and I'm gonna click on download. If we then head over to our downloads folder, click on the file, and this is the file here that we actually want. So I'm gonna click on copy. I have plugged a USB drive in, so I'm gonna paste it onto here. Then to enter the BIOS, what we're gonna to want to do is restart our computer. And whenever the screen goes black, I'm gonna start pressing the delete key on the keyboard and that will take us into the BIOS. So I'm starting pressing the delete key. Okay, and that's us into the BIOS. Okay, so taking a look at the BIOS version, we can see it's from the 26th to the 11th, 21. So we do have a later version on the USB drive. Um, if you're gonna make any changes to the BIOS, I would recommend updating the BIOS first because then you're gonna lose any changes when the new BIOS installs. So what we're gonna do is click on M flash and click on yes. Okay, and we're gonna find our version of the BIOS. So this is it here. And there's the version that we're gonna to want to update to. Now it's gonna ask us, are we sure we want to select this file? Now, importantly, you shouldn't really update the BIOS unless the new version offers features that you actually want or need. Um, the reason for that is it's possible to actually brick your motherboard during the BIOS update. I'm doing it today just to show you how to do it, and it has actually been quite a while since the last BIOS update. Importantly, you really wanna make sure your computer doesn't lose power during the update because that's a really good way to, to brick your motherboard. So I'm gonna click on yes and then it's gonna go ahead and update our BIOS. Okay, so that's us back into the BIOS and you can see it's been updated to the latest version. So there's a few things I want to do. The first is to check the speed our RAM is running at. So we click on the memory. We can see our RAM is currently running at 4800 megahertz, but it can run at 6000 megahertz, which is XMP profile number one. So we just need to go to the XMP profile, click on one, and that's gonna get our RAM running at 6,000 megahertz. Okay, next thing I'm gonna do is take a look at our fans. So we click here. Um, we've really only got two fans plugged in. We've got our CPU fans, which is a combination of our fans and pump all plugged in via that single header into our CPU fan header. Um, and we've also got our system fans. So starting off with our CPU fan, we can see it's taking its temperature off the CPU. It's currently in auto mode. I'm just gonna change it over to PWM. Um, and I'm happy then with the smart fan mode on the fan curve. If we then head over to our system fans, we've only got one plugged in to system fan header number six. Um, it's currently running in DC mode. It is only really a three pin connector, so that's the way we want it. We can enable smart fan mode, however, um, and it'll follow this particular fan curve. So at the moment, it's taking its temperature off the CPU. The only slight downside of doing this is as your temperatures go up and down, um, it can cause the fans in the case to ramp up and down. So you may want to set it to system where there's gonna be much less fluctuation and the fans aren't then gonna ramp up and down as much because the system temperature's not gonna change quite as much as the CPU. I'm gonna do the first bit of testing with it set to CPU. Um, you're gonna to have to check out my case review if you wanna see the temperatures but these are just the options you have. And again, you can play about with the curves by dragging them if you want to. I'm just gonna leave them on the default curves for now. And then the final thing I want to do is enable the resizable bar. So we head over to the advanced tab. We're gonna to go to the settings and we're gonna to go to advanced. And it's this one that we're looking for PCIe. Um, down the bottom, we've got the resize bar. I'm just gonna click enabled and that should be us. So if we close the BIOS down, it's gonna give a summary of what we've done. We'll enable the resize bar, CPU fan one's gone to PWM, um, system fan number six, we've enabled smart fan mode, and we've enabled our XMP profile. So we can click yes, and the PC will boot back into Windows. Okay, that's us back into Windows. So I just wanna check that our RAM is running at the right speed. So right click here, 
and go to Task Manager. We're going to click on More Details, we're going to click on the Performance tab and then click on the Memory. So we can see our RAM is currently running at 6000 megahertz and then I want to just check resizable bar has been enabled so we go down here and open the Nvidia settings we'll have to agree to the terms and we're going to want to click on system information and then if we look here resizable bar has been enabled so we can click on close Okay, so that's the build complete. The PC is not only running great, but also looks great as well. And I absolutely love this color scheme. I think it goes so well with the case's built-in cyan color. Now, what I'm planning to do now is a full case review. I'm also gonna do some thermal testing, work out what is the best cooling configuration for this case. So you are thinking of doing a build in it, you're definitely gonna to want to check out that video and you'll find a link to it in the description. If you have enjoyed this video, please remember to give it a thumbs up. And if you're not currently subscribed to the channel, please hit the subscribe button as well. Thanks for watching.